In Nicaragua, reforms to the electoral law ratified the defense of freedom, self-determination, and sovereignty. The Human Rights Commission has been working to negotiate the granting of humanitarian visas, residency, and other types of aid to members of the latest migrants' caravan. The head of the General Reserve expresses the need to completely end its liquidity injection program in the United States as of mid-March as part of the monetary stimulus initiated to deal with inflation. In Nicaragua, the reforms and additions to the electoral law and the condemnation of the Organization of American States for its interfering actions are the most significant agreements of the 37th Legislature of the National Assembly of the Central American Country. The president of the legislative body, Gustavo Borras, reported that Parliament held 362 plenary meetings during the current period for 756 legal norms. According to Porras, the changes to the electoral law guaranteed the democratic continuity of the process of updating, modernizing, and strengthening the electoral system in the Central American country. During the last session on Wednesday, the deputies ratified their commitment to the defense of freedom, self-determination, and sovereignty, expressed in a final resolution to denounce the OAS and the decision to leave this regional forum. Gustavo's speech emphasized two things that are very important. One, the number of challenges they've had, and two, the capacity for solutions that has been developed. These have been very hard years, but years that have tested the nature of this nation, and in this case, this assembly. This Wednesday, the president-elect of Andrea Xiomara Castro assured that she will not use state resources to finance the handover of power and that the key will ask for donations for its organization. The president-elect emphasized that her political organization, Partido Libertad y Refundación, has requested donations from the public for the event, which is scheduled to take place on January 27, 2022, and will be attended by representatives from various countries, regional organizations, and the Honduran people. Members of the political organizations backing the president-elect say they do not want to use state resources to finance a handover and also want to avoid money from uncertain sources. And the Bolivian Senate approved the 2022 state budget, which will now be sent to the executive branch for its subsequent enactment. After a long and extended debate, the bill was approved, prioritizing health, education, and production issues. The head of the Senate, Andronico Rodriguez, stated that the law was approved in the midst of observations and coincidences. Now the president of the Republic, Luis Arce, has 10 days to put the law into effect. According to the legislator, the consolidated budget is a set of revenues and expenses of the public administration, while the addition brings together the accounts of all entities of the public sector. Now regarding the upcoming second round of the presidential elections in Chile, Gabriel Boric and Jose Antonio Cast committed to support the transparency and integrity of the electoral process. As they say, the president of the Chilean Transparency Council, Gloria de la Fuente, said it was a positive sign both candidates committed themselves to respect the 16 proposals forwarded by the council ahead of the presidential elections. The organism pointed out the need to move towards a culture of integrity in public affairs and was emphatic in stating that one of the things that led to the social outburst, among many others, was the abuse of power and the use of public office to commit illegalities. The 16 points proposal entailed making progress in matters such as the creation of institutions that help to raise controls and standards in transparency issues. After the publication of a United Nations report which added to the one published by the Bogota Mayor's Office, the Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Colombia, Marta Lucia Ramirez, has denounced that the government cannot allow a disqualification of the institutions and the rule of law. In this sense, Ramirez asked the members of the UN office in the South American country not to engage in political activism since this would undermine the impartiality of the representation. In this way, Ivan Duque's administration attempted to disqualify the report that affirmed that members of the anti-riot squad of the National Police were responsible for at least 28 of the 46 verified deaths during the demonstrations. The office of the High Commissioner collected a battery of recommendations for the government in order to avoid its repetition. The representative of the High Commissioner, Vivian de Rivero, reaffirmed it was the international organization's duty to listen to the victims and their families. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away.
Hi, welcome back to From the South. We now update information on the migrant caravan that is currently in the capital of Mexico as it was learned that the Human Rights Commission has committed itself to granting humanitarian visas, residency and other aid. A delegation made up of 18 migrants from the caravan in Chiapas held a meeting with Rosario Piedra, head of the National Human Rights Commission, hours after their arrival in the capital. During the meeting, the requests of the migrants were raised, especially those referring to residence permits for those wishing to work in Mexico, as well as the accompaniment of those who have decided to continue their journey to the United States. Ireneo Mojica, one of the leaders of the caravan, assured that the National Human Rights Commission is a true ally and explained the scope of some of the agreements reached. But I do believe that there is the will to dissolve it here in Mexico City. The legal situation of the migrants depends on the Mexican state. Some are residencies, there are few, probably the residencies that people want, but also some are humanitarian visas or another type of document that is what we have to clarify according to the legal terms of the law. Because there are different humanitarian visas and they can be granted not only by Comar, but also by the National Institute of Migration. And in Haiti, the number of dead has risen to 75 following the explosion that occurred after a petrol vehicle overturned in the city of Cape Haitian. Prime Minister Ariel Henry rushed from the capital Port-au-Prince to the disaster area to assess the damage and visit the injured at a local hospital. During the visit, he assured that emergency funds for the affected city would be available to cover any damage. However, the deputy mayor of Cape Haiti, Patrick Almonor, indicated that some of the diseased were buried on Wednesday in a mass grave in the city cemetery, while other human remains continue to be buried in the St. Philomene Cemetery. European Union's leader has held a one-day summit on a Thursday to discuss the most pressing topics on the continent, such as the future of the bloc's defense policy and the fight against COVID-19. Foreign policy and security issues also dominated the agenda as well as a migration crisis along the bloc's borders with Belarus and the defense strategy presented last month by the European Union foreign policy chief Josep Borrell. Three recently inaugurated leaders, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, his Austrian counterpart Karl Niemann and Swedish Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson participated for the first time at the summit. The gathering in the Belgian capital comes at a fragile moment for the bloc following a period of optimism marked by the decrease in coronavirus cases and the accelerating economic growth. The EU is once again in deep uncertainty as the Omicron variant spreads and new restrictions stunt business activity. The Pan American Health Organization confirmed on Wednesday that the Omicron variant of coronavirus has been detected in nine countries and territories in the Americas. The new COVID-19 variant has been confirmed in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, Trinidad and Tobago and Bermuda. The organization said that this variant has been detected mainly as a result of travel. It added that all data on transmission remains very limited. Although the Delta variant is prevalent in all the subregions, a warn of the danger of the combination as Omicron is proving to be potentially more contagious. The Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus himself, described the situation as seriously alarming. WHO is not against boosters. 27 countries have now reported cases of Omicron, and the reality is that Omicron is probably in most countries, even if it hasn't been detected yet. Omicron is spreading at a rate we have not seen with any previous variant. Regarding Omicron's ability to spread, Bruce Aylward, an advisor to the UN agency, expressed concern about false beliefs about the new variant and the approaching Christmas holidays. Concerned that people are jumping to a conclusion that this is a mild disease. Now, if we go into a season like we're going into now, when a lot of people want to get together holiday season and we have a more transmissible virus that we don't actually know its clinical course very uh, clearly, we could be setting ourselves up for a very dangerous situation. So, comment. We have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The President of the United States General Reserve, Jerome Powell, admitted on Wednesday that inflation is already widespread in the North American nation. Until a few hours ago, the entity insisted that the rise in prices was under control and only concentrated in certain sectors. Powell predicted that it will remain above the institution's target, meaning above 2 percent until well into 2022. During a press conference, the head of the institution said he left interest rates unchanged at between 0 and 0 0.25 percent and accelerated the pace of tapering of its bond buying program. After these announcements, Powell clarified that the central bank is now expected to completely end its liquidity injection program in mid-March as part of the monetary stimulus initiated in the wake of the coronavirus crisis. At the end of his presentation, the senior officials sought to reassure the country that the U.S. economy is robust. Now we share with you information from the south of the United States as only a few moments a Homestead Air Reserve base in Miami-Dade County had to be evacuated for what the military authorities have described in a brief statement as an incident in progress. Miami police have been deployed in the vicinity to take control of the tra traffic as several neighbors have confirmed that they were ordered to stay in their homes and others who were driving in the area were forced to stop without being given any information except that there was an irregular situation at the military base which was evacuated on Wednesday night due to an ordinance, for example, some weapon or ammunition that was damaged. The neighbors confined by military orders affirmed that at first it was a potentially explosive material. The concern, uh, while the military source reiterated that so far no one has been injured. To find out that things are happening at the air base as they are now is somewhat disturbing. What is really going on, especially on this day and at this time? You don't know what to think. After a year in which China has worked more on risk prevention and support for recovery, the country's key policymakers are now looking to 2022 to focus on stability and keeping economic growth within a reasonable range to meet the nation's goals. More details in the following report by our correspondent, Iram Siparasa. Undoubtedly the most important and repeated word at China's recent Central Economic World Conference where the country's leaders set out the economic agenda for the coming year. After a 2021 in which they were committed to controlling risk and boosting the recovery. China will focus on stabilizing the economy and keeping growth within a reasonable range in 2022. According to an official statement from the conference, which added that the country will continue to implement a prudent monetary policy and proactive fiscal measures. Beijing also assures that it will take measures to boost demand, maintain industrial production and exports, support markets entities, and ensure an orderly shift to the domestic market, based on the new model in which China leaders have pinned their hopes for the nation's future development. The International Atomic Energy Agency had reached a deal with Iran to replace damaged surveillance cameras at the Kalak Centrifuge Component Manufacturing Workshop. Tehran authorities said Iran said it agreed to grant access to the international organization in an effort to prevent misunderstandings. As per a law passed by the Iranian parliament, the United Nations organization will not have access to the recordings from the cameras, which will be installed after technical reviews by Iranian experts. Since February 2021, Iran has stopped the voluntary implementation of the addition protocol, a document that provided the Atomic Energy Agency with extended monitoring capabilities as part of the country's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers. Tehran also said it will hand over the recordings only when the United States, which unilaterally abandoned the nuclear deal in 2018, lifts sanctions imposed on the Persian nation. And the Syrian government and multiple international analysts denounced that the Cooperation Council of the Gulf Monarchies is attempting to erode the strategic relationship between Syria and Iran by accusing Tehran of interference. Our correspondent Hisham Wunus has a story. The Cooperation Council of the Gulf Oil Monarchies, at the conclusion of its 42nd summit in Saudi Arabia on Tuesday, December 14, reaffirm the commitment to the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Syria. However, the Council said it was against regional interference 
in the internal affairs of Damascus, which, in his opinion, seeks to provoke a demographic change in the Arab country. This was an indirect aim at Iran, seeking to provoke a rift between Damascus as an allied Tehran, according to experts. The latest talks that took place between the Gulf monarchies and Iran did not produce the results expected by the Gulf Cooperation Council states, which is why they are trying to exert political pressure on the Persian nation by issuing a communique pointing to Iran as an interfering force seeking to provoke a demographic change in Syria, and thus trying to mobilize the Arab and Syrian people of Sunni religion tendency in particular against Iran. At the same time, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, defended before the cross-border entry of humanitarian aid into Syria, the Security Council, without the approval of Damascus, a mechanism that both government and citizens condemn, as in addition to violating the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country, it is used to provide logistical, military, and financial support to terrorist gangs and Kurdish separatist militias under the false excuse of guaranteeing necessities to Syrians. The Secretary General of the United Nations, instead of acting in the service of agendas of countries hostile to Syria, should have clarified the reason why Syria needs humanitarian aid and denounced that the countries that impose this terrorist war on Syria are the ones who are really responsible for starving the Syrian people. We really hope that he would have the courage to denounce these states and not to violate international law with this statement. Meanwhile, although open to the normalization of relations with other Arab nations, Damascus rejects any pretension that these rapprochement be in exchange for distancing from its allies of the resistance bloc, including Iran, a position endorsed by the Syrian people who in turn denounce the use of the United Nations as a platform to politicize their humanitarian case in the service of Western plans against their country. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Tell Us Our English. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.